point. And then someone said to me, well, then don't wear your tie when you're drinking coffee, Shem. You know, and like, oh, you mean there's some things I can do. Um, but this is how it slowly started to just sink into my consciousness. And I would do the third step in the morning. And I'd go to that meeting. And, and I'd I've quickly got, make uh, a few phone calls in the morning here. on my way to work. So, so, uh, you know, I pull off the How's it going, man? What's new? Broker Shem. Um, I just went to my local Jerusalem pizza. So uh, I saw the link. So I popped on anyways, even though I was stuff in my face i got my uh chili cheese fries um nachos and cheese sticks and a greek salad and i, bu I uh, bumped into uh one of my first rabbi's sons now i guess he's a successful businessman and we're talking a few minutes you know like uh, i think i was nice how come you don't come around anymore but like yeah he is uh your brother and sister now are grandparents i remember when they first got married um you know now they're grandparents uh but uh you know, it's difficult i did on my week in review the last few weeks a series i called like my failures as a jew and part of it it, it was my failure to adapt into the orthodox community and then my failure to uh integrate my judaism into larger judaism specifically related to like zionism and the war where uh um you know, where this uh, came out. I'm not sure if you saw I had my big appearance with Keith Woods this week. I was on Mario Nuffel and uh, Stephen James just hit a thousand subscribers and I was showing him this book, um, Schindler's Gift. Oh, How One Man Harnessed ADHD to Change the World. And uh, it's autographed by the author who was a teacher at my um, you know, Frankfurt school freudian uh, high school for the gifted and uh a lot of kids had adhd there he went on to become like a world expert on adhd and a life coach and his theory is adhd could give you special powers that uh, other people don't have although it does have its problems and he historically re-diagnosed oscar schindler and claim that Oscar Schindler had ADHD from uh, his you know, uh, reading his biography and looking into it. And uh, that was part of what was capable for Schindler to do what he did was in fact his ADHD. And, uh, you know, it could be, uh, you know, a powerful tool if harnessed uh, correctly, uh, but also you know, obviously dangerous and uh, led to many of the problems that Schindler had in his life. And maybe you also, where you've had uh, many successes in your life, a thrill seeker, um, ups and downs, like you were mentioning, your inability to take care of some basic things that uh, other people, uh, you know, quick to get bored with, not wanting to do things that are interesting. Um, but uh, at the same time, that it's allowed you to uh, accomplish things that uh, many other people haven't accomplished and, and you know he puts uh, you know Schindler related to his ADHD as the thrill seeker and I don't know if uh, you would classify yourself as that Luke Ford the thrill seeker yeah I, I think I I am I I, I do seek seek thrills <laughs> yeah I think that's part of what draws me to uh, live streaming that's that's interesting have have you ever been diagnosed with ADHD No, I saw a psychiatrist in high school and I wasn't diagnosed with anything. Um, and I don't think I have any technical disorders. You know, like I sometimes will play that I have like, you know, severe psychological problems, but I don't technically have any uh, disorders. I saw a psychologist a few times, uh, twice uh, in my youth for you know, one time and when I was like, 10 years old even for like a period of like six months uh, i saw psychiatrist weekly and then also in high school um but uh i study psychology i'd like psychology i think i function differently um you know, maybe just like an intp or uh high you uh i mean i could self-diagnose my way in a bunch of ways but i don't think i would actually uh give myself an actual disorder and uh, but but I could see that you you might be more likely to have an actual disorder if you want to say ADHD, and uh, that might be explanatory to your successes and failures in life. Yeah. Do Do you have any particular attitude towards uh, psych psychiatric medication? Um, 
I mean, God forbid I, I did marijuana for years. Um, I, I would say it's almost always second best. If you don't need it, you're better off without it. But uh, if you need it, you should do it. That uh, especially like ADHD. So I think they had, uh, when I was young, they gave people like lithium and, and that was like a severe downer. So there's like Ritalin, uh, which I guess is upper, but then there's also like uh, lithium, which was a downer. And uh, like, if you can't, especially when you're younger kids who can't control their behavior uh, might uh, have outbursts in school or even the violent where they need to be given a downer as opposed to Ritalin, which uh, if it's successful, um, maybe, uh, but uh, yeah, I think if you just understand your difficulties, maybe have a close cohort of people who care about you, give you good advice, understand uh, your situation in life and your uh, good and bad points that could help you out with your difficulties. You know, okay, you're an older man now, so I mean, if your parents uh, or you don't have like a close family, but but uh, you know, my mom constantly nags me, so maybe in the Orthodox Jewish community, uh, you could give an equivalent to to like naggers that uh, like people in the Orthodox community are constantly like nagging you, and that could be a good thing to uh, you help you with your shortcomings, which would uh, might be failure to do. Uh, basic things that are necessary for your success in life that you just feel are unimportant or unexciting. Uh, but if you had someone in your life constantly nagging you that uh, you might be able to do that and then uh, you accomplish quite a bit, even in some ways more than your average person. And what sort of things, I don't want you to damage yourself and damage your relationship with your mother, but what, what sort of things does your mother nag you about that you'd feel comfortable sharing publicly oh i mean she nags me about everything really like i mean i, I still see my mom almost uh, daily but uh you know just uh my cleanliness my uh you know getting a haircut uh my, my clothes you know, like uh regular maintenance and health uh, checkups uh paying my taxes uh um you, you basically just all normal motherly things like my diet my health um my personal relationships and, you know, when we lived together when I was young, you know, it would have been, uh, you know, like daily chores or uh, irregular cleanliness, um, uh, inappropriate behavior. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think those are familiar to most people who have a, a mother that's uh, in their life on a, on a regular basis. Uh, does she say anything about your live streaming? No, she doesn't really follow it or like... Uh, you know, watch any of the content and it would be too difficult to like, uh, explain. I, I was interviewed on this like Swedish channel the other day and I mentioned it to my mom. She thought that was neat. Although it turned out they were like these huge, like anti-vaccine COVID conspiracy theorists. They're just, uh, we, we talked about a few other things, but you know, just kind of random this, uh, they reached out and wanted to talk. So I mentioned that to my mother, but usually I don't mention it, uh, you know, cause she just, is not familiar with the technology. Um, my mother's also like a lawyer. You know, she had worked for the IRS even briefly. So like on a business level, I, I heard um, you mentioned to Elliot about your, your financial difficulties where uh, you know, like uh, maybe may relate to your automobile or something where if just my mother is like super responsible and uh you know, she pays the bills right away. She always has like a calendar with uh, all the things that uh, you know, are coming up that need to be taken care of. So if it was something like you're renewing your auto insurance, uh, getting your oil changes or and any of these things that would just be uh, you know, something that you don't want to do uh, that you keep on putting off as opposed to being um, preemptively responsible and uh, that in the long run could cause you financial damage uh, that uh, you know, like uh, from a business level. So my mother is a corporate attorney, um, like on a nagging level of the type things that might have uh, made you more successful as a business person. Like, you know, did you file this paperwork or did you organize your business tax structures or, or in a certain way that uh, would have made you more profitable, so on and so on. And uh, so thousands upon thousands of people watched your live stream with uh, Keith, Keith Woods. 
Keith Woods is a notorious figure on the uh, dissident right. He seems to have views that are perhaps best uh, summed up as national socialist. Uh, any highlights from your discussion with Keith Woods? Um, so two things. One was, you know, he put an interview with the rabbi and like we talked about it beforehand. I told him we get pushed back from it. And he even joked on the stream, like, you know, was he put like interview with a half Jew cussed from Detroit? It wouldn't have been as exciting. Um, he seemed relatively reasonable. I mean, I mean, because in his interview, we were talking about frame games and that woman, uh, Kristen right. Ruby, who uh, claimed that uh, frame games was behind the band, the ADL uh, movement, um, which uh, he was not sure or not whether that's accurate. Uh, but so on Monday, I was on Mario Nuffel, who I, I'm not sure if you've seen Mario Nuffel yet. I'm not sure either. Tell He's the biggest it. Twitter space guy in Twitter. He's actually Australian. I think I mean, he's Arab of some background, um, but grew up in Australia, went to Monash University, now lives in Dubai and uh, a businessman. I think he's actually a multimillionaire many times over and uh you know, entrepreneurship. He has uh, spaces on like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and just all sorts of news topics. Uh, Elon Musk has been a guest on his channel. He's one of the bigger guys, like the new wave of Twitter uh, since Elon Musk took it over. Elon Musk retweets him all the time. And uh, he has, uh, he did a series of streams on the band, the ADL movement, uh, largely like in defense of Elon Musk and uh, but i say he's not american like he's australian uh, uh uaw uh in his uh, in his is international space uh and then when the war broke out in israel he's been having regular podcasts uh so i reached out like to be a, a guest on his channel about the band the adl movement and the first stream i was going to they didn't end up putting me on like uh, their stream got cut short and they had so many guests that uh, they didn't put me on so he reached out just uh, Sunday. Is like, okay, we're doing another piece uh, on media matters and the ADL, and uh, invited me on. So I was on. I spoke just a few minutes about um, somewhat defending the ADL or Jews, saying that uh, free speech is dangerous for Jews. Not necessarily my personal opinion. I even mentioned that that I favor free speech, but uh, Jews in general, um, you know, as a minority, protected minority. Uh, and then like uh, Keith Woods pushed back on that. And then he did a post stream on his channel and he had uh, clipped that. And so uh, he reached out to talk. So the next day we talked and uh, we discussed what we're going to talk about. So he said he wanted to just ask me basic questions on Judaism. So I said, if that's the case, he could do it like, uh, like ask the rabbi. So uh, most of it was kind of just like a basic ask the rabbi, like a Talmudic text. Uh, what did Jews believe? Uh, a messianic thing versus law uh, sectarianism he wanted to understand anti-zionism and uh, the breakdown of like Haredim, ultra-orthodox jews how many of them are there where are they what are their political beliefs and you know then later on he brought in uh, mario nuffil's uh jewish co-host for his streams on the war in israel and adl and like that guy just came on straight and like bashed me. He's like, this guy is not a rabbi. And, uh, and, uh, you know, so it was, that, that was kind of like as expected. Cause I even told Keith at the beginning, like, uh, you know, like out of respect, if I'm teaching you about Judaism, you could call me rabbi. Although I told him I'm not a rabbi, but rabbi means different things to different people. And, uh, that, uh, I call hundreds of people rabbi. You mean, I call liberal female rabbis. Uh, I call, you know, basically any Orthodox Jew that I deal with in a Torah learning setting rabbi. Uh, so I said, like, rabbi could be a respectful term just to make the conversation more seriously that I'm answering his questions about Torah in the text. But I got a lot of pushback on that. Like, this guy is not a rabbi. And, uh, you know, this Israeli guy came on, even though he's not religious at all. Like, he took issue with me being called a rabbi. Uh, and then Lucas Gage and... Uh, no more news were on um i think it's similar back to it's really just because of the war so there's interest in judaism because of the war and most of it is from counter semites 
that uh, you're like, okay, what's going on with Israel? Why the war? Why do the elites uh, like Israel so much? And um, so two things. One thing, like like this guy, uh, Benjamin Zev, like the uh, Israeli expat who uh, is Mario's uh, co-host, uh, you know, was like, I could get you a better rabbi, like Zionist or anti-Zionist. And I pushed back, like, no way. <laughs> no rabbi is going to speak to these guys other than me. And I even had, like, no more use. Like, I've been doing this for five years. You are not going to find a rabbi to talk to you. Like, Duvid is the best you're going to get. And I used to, I think I told you that, or Charles Moskowitz, like, uh, um, I don't think you'd be able to get a rabbi to come on these streams, especially in, like, a hostile environment to talk to a counter-Semite. It's just not what rabbis do. And, uh, um, but on Keith Wood's stream, you, you were treated respectfully. Yeah. And the comments were actually all relatively positive. Like, you know, just like a cultural exchange, you know, like, uh, commending me for my honesty, I guess. And he pressed me on a lot of issues about like the messianic beliefs and a breakdown, like of my perception about how many people believe these various things, uh, statements in the Talmud. And I did my best largely to, defend the jewish people and defend some of these beliefs like well, well yeah like we think we're going to be rewarded uh but uh not necessarily in a way like uh you know we think we're going to be like held over the the nations and the world and you're all going to be our slaves but just think we're going to be rewarded uh for for doing this and uh, some notion of what it means to be the chosen people some questions about the statements in the talmud and uh the nature of the talmud in relationship to how Jewish law is practiced. They're saying we follow the sages of the generation, so we don't actually follow the Talmud. The Talmud is just uh, uh, the recording of the sages of that period of time. And uh, he was also very curious about uh, Haredi anti-Zionism. So I know a lot about that, and I broke down why Haredim, uh, what it means for Haredim to be anti-Israel, and then also the political, like how many anti-Zionists are there, What's the difference of like the small sect of Notori Karta that actually do protest versus, uh, you know, people who are just politically anti-Zionist and then even uh, the anti-Zionist like in Israel that even uh, like united toward Judaism that even serve in the government, but their official theological stance is anti-Zionist. And then, you know, having the Israeli come on and uh, kind of randomly attack me uh, somewhat proved my point uh, that uh, he was like, well, this, this is just how we are. You're like two Jews, 10 opinions, and uh, Jewish sectarianism that uh, most Jews aren't religious. So, I, you know, I told them that, you know, Judaism, is Judaism what Jews do? Or is Judaism what the religion teaches, what the rabbis say, what the sages, and, you know, broke down how many Jews actually value the sages, follow what the sages teach versus uh, what Jews do. So we, we didn't even really talk much about multiculturalism and immigration. It was more... Uh, theology and uh general questions about Haredim. now you're not a zionist would you I, I believe would you regard yourself as hostile to zionism i'm not politically active so i just say my my uh belief system in judaism I, i'd be neutral to anti-zionist although i'm not involved in anti-zionist activities just if you ask me i would say the creation of israel was probably a mistake i supported one state solution um giving immediate full citizenship and also i think the main cause of the war right now and obviously you have the violence of hamas and other factors but uh, that uh, it's zero sum and the main cause of the conflict is in fact zionism and we're reaching a brink point where basically israel has to give up on zionism or uh commit to a full ethnic cleansing because uh you can't really have both and then i would say religiously like i don't need a jewish ethno state i don't see that as part of my judaism um and you know learn from my rabbis that uh it, the the state of israel is heretical and then the difficulty to jews in relationship to anti-semitism where you have a state actor so you know, we're worrying about rising anti-Semitism and like the alt-right and things like, okay, the Jews support multiculturalism and immigration. And certainly that's going to cause some pushback in uh, anti-Semitism, the group conflict, uh, but like nothing is going to cause group conflict and anti-Semitism than the Jews collectively killing tens of thousands of people. 
uh, you know, in terms of like the escalation, and if the Jews escalate the war to where, uh, uh, you know, if the if Israel doesn't back off, where in all likelihood uh, we will end up killing uh, fifty to hundred thousand people, and uh, you're saying like, yeah, that would likely dramatically escalate anti-Semitism, and um, when I was talking with Stephen James, that uh, I think what's likely to happen is you're going to see a Gazan refugee crisis and the Gazans are going to end up in the United States. Uh, you know, I was even arguing with my dad and brother over Thanksgiving who don't really follow it, but they, they, they kind of had this view that, yeah, like the Gazans are going to end up in some other Arab nations. Like, no, no, it's not going to happen. Like, God forbid they're going to end up here. We've created this huge refugee crisis and uh, Egypt, the other Arab nations, there's almost zero chance they're going to take them. And like Kevin Michael Gray says, anytime the United States gets involved in these foreign wars, those people end up here. So I think that's what you're going to start seeing over the next few months is uh, you know, the slow influx of guys and refugees. And if the war continues, it could even be a massive influx of hundreds of thousands of Gazans to the United States. Is there any update in the Samantha Wall case? She's the synagogue president and a political activist who was uh, found found Continuing dead. Continuing to Anything work to get new going on Nothing. in that case. Nothing. I mean, they they had arrested somebody who they said like was at her funeral, was a, a part of the synagogue, and then they released him without telling who he was or whether he was the uh, suspect in the murder. Um, most people are leaning towards a domestic dispute. I don't know not enough about her to uh, say who she might have been dating or, or but uh, I think God forbid it's uh, like it's it's likely that I stopped going to the synagogue before COVID-19 and there's a lot of new people going there. There's some speculation that it might have been someone on the board of the synagogue or someone that the majority of the people of the synagogue know. So uh, um, and that likely the, the police highly think that it's a certain person but just don't have any evidence um what evidence the police have like if they have evidence like she left the wedding with somebody or maybe she was uh there was somebody staying at her at her apartment um but there's not actually evidence to like a weapon or to uh, pin a pin pin an arrest and so it may not be solved um i mean from the general public perspective he's like yeah like maybe anti-semitism but from the police investigative uh, expert, they said like, no, it was like her, it was her boyfriend, and uh, you know, ironically, I, I can't even find out who her boyfriend is. Like, I'm sure people at the synagogue know and are speculating that uh, that it's probably a person who did it. Uh, but uh, I don't know her well enough for the synagogue, and they're keeping that pretty uh, close lip to say if if there's a suspect that they're saying like, yeah, it was probably this guy that we all know and go to synagogue with. God forbid. Wow. And does the Detroit Police Department have a good reputation for solving these types of crimes for overall competence? No, I mean, like 75 percent of murders in Detroit go unsolved. So uh, in all likelihood, it would not go unsolved. And uh, they, they put out reward. It even there's like a fifteen thousand dollar Crime Stopper reward. And so some comments are like, well, how come the Jewish community is not putting out like a hundred thousand, half a million dollar reward? She comes from a wealthy family. Her parents are doctors. Her grandfather, like they had like a family foundation where like her family foundation um, was one of the bigger donors to the synagogue. So how come there's only a fifteen thousand dollar reward? So people are speculating that uh, it's someone in the Jewish community that other people know that is the prime suspect. And that's not why they're not uh, you know, putting out like a huge reward to find information as if it was like just suspected that it was a random crime or uh, um, uh, anti-Semitism. Although it's also possible like she was pretty liberal and thinking like, what would she want to do? Uh, you know, she supported Black Lives Matter in these, in, uh, um, although she was pro-Israel, uh, but uh, you know, she did in her faith, you know, what would she want to do? Would she be so concerned with uh, finding the perpetrator and having them punished? Um, but uh yeah, so most of the speculation is it's someone within the Jewish community uh, that uh, that killed her, and and therefore it's uh, unclear what the Jewish community wants to do with it because it would probably be a disaster for the Jewish community for it to come out like that. Uh, but uh, I don't know any more than that, 
it's basically no information. There's no information within the Jewish community, like uh, you like saying like uh, who she might have, who like even the, the person who was arrested. So it was clearly someone from the synagogue who was arrested, um, but uh, there's been no release of the name. There's been no leak in the Jewish community um, of who this person was, although presumably people tight with her in the synagogue all know who the person who was arrested and released was. Now, I see you started doing live streams with uh, Jen once again. So when did you restart this? It was just a one-time thing, and it was because I started streaming with this guy in Japan, Kevin McCarran, who's like an Anglo expat uh, kind of counter-Semite, although ironically he uh, went to university at bar -Lan University, PhD in neuroscience, and now he's in Japan. And when the war started, kind of like Keith Woods, you know, he wanted a Jew to talk to related to ask you know basic questions on judaism jewish belief eschatology and the war in israel and we started streaming and it turned out that he you know, has a phd in neuroscience but he was also semi-friendly to uh reincarnation transmigration of souls so i convinced jennifer to uh do a stream together so i mean she's still around like we canceled week in review because she just didn't have sunday night tonight available which is monday morning for her um, but she's still around. Um, uh, you know, so I reached out to her and asked her if she wanted to do a separate stream just on the you know her favorite topic of reincarnation. So she said yes. So you've done uh, two live streams about your failures as a Jew. Which one was the most painful or challenging or, or difficult to talk about? Well, I don't think any of them were painful because I would kind of pretty familiar with it. So actually I did three. I called the last one Jewish anti anti-Zionism because uh yeah I, I gave my history of going to Israel and becoming familiar with the uh, and uh Orthodox anti-Zionism and how my rabbis were anti-Zionist and how like as a Balchuva from Detroit, half Jew from Detroit, I was shocked at the vitriol that Orthodox Jews had towards the state of Israel. Um and then I it took me a long time to understand. Um but yeah, with the war, like I saw a few things, like one thing, like just seeing my rabbi's son at Jerusalem Pizza, I failed to integrate into Orthodox culture. And I think that's somewhat all or nothing. Orthodox culture is like all or nothing. So it's very hard, it's very difficult to be half half. And so it's not surprising I failed in that manner. Um, and then my failure in the larger Jewish community, where um one thing, because I had anti-Zionist leanings, that uh, that's extremely unpopular among organized Jews, liberal Jews, or, or most of them don't even believe me. I tell them, like, well, like, no, my rabbis are anti-Zionist. The Kratom were anti-Zionist. This is what the rabbis taught me, uh, that your average, like, organized Jew, secular Jew, they, they don't, they're not even going to believe you that uh, that's what my rabbis taught me. And, uh, and then also... I couldn't really find a place in the Jewish world because secular Jews don't really value what Orthodox Jews value, which is mainly like prayers, minion, um, and Torah learning. And so the Jewish community kind of organized around me. And like, I mean, Stephen James says, I'm not, I don't want to be a resentful person to say like that. I think I deserve to be a leader of the Jews, uh, but uh, the Jewish people are even secular uh liberal Jews are hierarchical people. We're not egalitarian people. So even like the reconstructionist, uh, um, the feminist, the, the, the liberal, the federations, they're all hierarchical and they raised up leaders around me. They're all very skeptical of me. So uh, you like, I, I really had a complete failure as I, I like, I feel successful as a Jew. Like I, I, I think I understand Judaism. Well, I do the practices, the prayers, the ritual, um, but uh, yeah, like they raised up leadership around me that was all skeptical of me and that uh, doesn't really even like me around. And then like, let alone my failure to find a, a wife and get married. And it's like, well, Sam Wool, like she was a feminist, even if I could, even, even if I could have like asked her out and she would have said yes. Um, how would that have worked out? Like she was a feminist. She wasn't uh, friendly to orthodoxy. And uh, you know, like her Judaism was completely intertwined with like, Black Lives Matters and democratic uh, politics and pro-immigration organizing and even the downtown synagogue. So it's not just like, okay, let you know, like it's a liberal synagogue. You could just come to the synagogue and do your thing. 
It's like, no, there's a hierarchical order. There's people in charge and they're very uh, intent. Like, this is what we're doing. And if you're not on board with our leadership, uh, we don't want you here. And uh, I, mean, I don't know if you agree that they say like uh, Judaism across the board is very hierarchical. They raise up leadership and uh, it, not just Orthodox Judaism, but also liberal Judaism. It's basically all or nothing. Yeah, there, there's something to that. It's definitely a highly competitive way of life, and it does tend to take over your life. But have you had any second thoughts about uh, trying anew to reintegrate into a, a synagogue community? No, I, I think I have to find, like, if, if I found a wife and had children, I, I would. But at this point, I, I don't think I'm actually going to find a wife through integrating in a synagogue community. So I've more tried to strike it out on my own. You know, so like Michael, who uh, is from a distant area, doesn't know many Jews or like uh, Keith Woods. And even just saying like, okay, like to Keith Woods or unaffiliated Jew, like I'm a rabbi. But if you're affiliated with Judaism, even like Israeli, you're just like, this guy's absolutely not a rabbi. He is a fraud. If he's telling you he's a rabbi, he's a fraud and a liar. So, uh, like, there's that dynamic where, like, yeah, I know a lot about Judaism. I love Judaism. I could basically take from scratch uh, and train someone up as a baltruva with my knowledge. Um, but eventually they're going to integrate within a community, and there's going to be a hierarchical structure of accepting their leadership in order to be part of the community. I mean, like, Detroit's not big enough. L.A., I could probably do like your game or like I did in New York where there's uh, just so many Jews and so many round, you could synagogue hop or you could find a conglomeration of Orthodox Jews that aren't happy with any of the rabbis and kind of have like an egalitarian gathering. Um, but like the guy Ben Yaman Zev on the Keith Woods space said like, well, rabbis, they're, they're ordained. They perform uh, you, you know family functions, weddings, bar mitzvah so he had a bar mitzvah or a wedding and like he doesn't know anything from judaism but he knows like when he got married or, or uh, you know he had a bar mitzvah or the funeral there's a rabbi there and that rabbi is ordained so like i would assume even in your structure that if you found like a group of uh people that aren't really happy with the with the rabbinic hierarchy or status in hollywood or los angeles that still they have families and they uh have to have the rabbis officiate over that and then they have children they need their children to be accepted um you know maybe there's enough schools you could bounce them around schools or or competition but uh um so yeah i think i figure i'm better bouncing out on my own and uh you're trying to uh uh and, and i have some success at that like you know, relatively i like being a jew uh where um there's no other like competition from Jewish organizations around where uh, you know, there's no affiliated Jew uh, Judaism to be in competition with and not necessarily like competition, but uh, you know, just to say like, uh, well, you're a Jew. That means these guys are your, uh, you're part of this organization or you're following this authority structure to just be like, I'm just a Jew. This is what I believe. This is what I practice. You want to talk about, it, I love talking about this stuff versus like defending the actions in Israel or defending uh, the power structures that be. Yeah. And I'll call that yeah. my failure my failure as a Jew to integrate with the community because I think I succeeded as a Jew in, in like the learning, uh knowing how to be an Orthodox Jew, uh studying the text, uh practicing it, but I failed in integration with uh, the community. So my my theory is that we all tend to prefer to do things that we're good at. And so my my theory with regard to what you're talking about is that you found that you were more comfortable and better at uh, live streaming about Judaism than practicing Judaism in a real life concrete community. No, I think I was pretty good at practicing Judaism in a live community. Um, you're saying like, okay, at the downtown synagogue, like I was instrumental in creating a Torah learning program, creating Minion, and I got forced out by democratic processes that just weren't interested in that. And then in the Orthodox community, um, 
I was relatively like integral. Like I was a respectful Bal Tshuva. I did what rabbis told me. People were very impressed that I took things seriously. I knew how to learn. I knew how to daven. I could almost, uh, I mean, not greatly, but I could even, uh, you know, uh, daven for the Omed, lead, lead uh, Torah service, read from the Torah. I served as assistant rabbi to, um, you know, many rabbis found a function. It was uh, my inability to go all or nothing and you know fully in because of my family situation and my inability to get married um so like as i got older uh and living a dual life when i decided to go back to university but but i think i was actually relatively quite successful in becoming an orthodox jew it just uh um it was too difficult to play both sides and you know at the end if it was either orthodoxy or um my greater life with my you know family or the secular world I, I was kind of forced out into choosing the secular world and uh, my inability to uh, get married. And as I got older, just, uh, you know, the assumption is that uh, something's wrong with me because I, I didn't get married. Right. Which, but uh, is, it just, might be accurate. Is, is it purely coincidence that when you took up, uh, shortly after you took up live streaming, that you increasingly dropped out of in-person real life uh, synagogue community and you developed an online community. Is it just uh, a coincidence that these two things developed simultaneously? I think it was COVID-19. I mean, like I started, uh, like I went to synagogue all the holidays. I still occasionally went to events in the Orthodox community. Uh, it was COVID-19 where I completely dropped out of uh, the community and uh and then, like, I never reintegrated since COVID-19. Um, but, yeah, I mean, certainly uh, the streaming, talking with you, um, you're getting feedback from different uh, sources, dealing with some counter-Semites and, and understanding different things about uh, America made me realize better I was never going to integrate into the Black Hat Orthodox community um, and maybe led me less so uh, but uh, no, I was still going to the downtown synagogue every every Friday night. I was still going to Jewish events uh, right up until COVID-19. Now, I think there are probably millions of Americans who have dramatically reduced their participation in real life religious services since COVID. Is, is that your impression, too? Yeah. And it, I mean, COVID-19 was the biggest uh, where I saw like. I wasn't really part of anything. I me mean, saying like I just went to synagogue or went to events. I had a few friendly people, but when COVID nineteen hit, and people reorganized their life, you know, they formed like the pods or the little groups. Um, you know, it hit that I just wasn't really part of it. That I was just kind of a guy who like showed up on the periphery that maybe had some friends or some reputation in the community, but I wasn't an integral part of the community. And so I, mean, I think it was COVID nineteen that hit me like that, and then made you know re uh, reassess my life midlife crisis and try to return to academic uh, research instead of like trying to uh, spend the rest of my days failing to integrate into Orthodox Judaism or even to liberal Judaism that I would take a different uh, approach for the second half of my life that would be more academic. And you're yeah, definitely streaming because I don't think there's any IRL venue. I don't think it'll ever happen that there'll be an IRL venue where uh, you'll people will invite me to have like a conversation or uh, I mean, remotely possible that uh, I'll be put in front of a crowd to speak to, but I, I think that's pretty unlikely. So, uh, you know, streaming is probably replaced. Uh, it, it didn't really replace cause I didn't have that venue in my life. Like I, I was talking with Stephen James like that the other day, I mean, like uh, what you said, like you got 32 people watching, like, uh, Maybe at a chess club, like there is no circumstance ever where like I talk and multiple people listen or hanging over my words. Uh, occasionally at the chess club, maybe like there'll be, you know, especially now I'm coaching, there's youth, there'll be like a handful of kids listening or, or a small group of people uh, hovering around uh, related to chess. But uh, that's never happened. I don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, but streaming creates a venue for that. And uh, you know, seeing like, okay, like I felt part of Orthodox Judaism, seeing like my rabbi's son, he was very friendly to me. How come you're not coming around anymore? You should come around more more often. 
But like, yeah, when I do come around, I'm you're just like, okay, I go to Minion, I shake a few hands, I speak to a few people. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess I guess COVID nineteen like made me internalize the isolation and uh, made me also the streaming so I could have success. Like uh, like if I was, um, I don't know, depressed or just relegated, I say, okay, like I'm gonna be relegated to being kind of this like half Jew bolchuva that every that uh, a lot of people don't even like the rest of my life um that streaming led me to see like oh i could actually have success and find some sort of function um that uh i hadn't seen possible before right do you agree as a general principle people prefer to do things that they're good at so for some people that means you know real life uh being part of a real life orthodox community for other people it means playing a lot of video games for other people means playing a lot of basketball. For other people, it means hanging out in a sports bar. For other people, it might mean working 80 hours a week coding. But I think we all naturally orient and prefer to do things where we're pretty good. Yeah, self-esteem. Like self-esteem is partly due to expertise. And that's you know somewhat why I've, you said like chess coaching is probably the most successful thing in my life. Um, because I'm pretty good at chess, I'm pretty successful at it. So, uh, you know, I get good responses. The kids that I coach end up uh, performing well, and it adds to my self-esteem. You know, nothing, uh, nothing argues uh, uh, like success. So, uh, um, you got to find out what you're good at. And we talked about that at like a, a while ago, maybe even over a year ago, where you could do things for the Orthodox community, but uh, you like a lot of times you're, you're relegated to just kind of like simple service cleaning driving and uh like what function could i actually do that's useful for the community or it's going to be an under utilization of my skills or if it's simply just like okay we'll take your money you could donate money um so i found use even with like the hindus the Hare krishnas like i found like uh you know like i was a valued part of their community i did things um you know a lot of them were new immigrants a lot of them were engineers. A lot of them like to have esoteric uh, theological discussions in, in a way that I wasn't valued in the Jewish community. And so, like, it fed my self-esteem even to be, okay, like, you know, what's this weird half-Jew keep on coming to the Indian temple for? Uh, but uh, but at least I had a value uh, as part of the community. Like, I went to the temple. I performed services. I volunteered. I helped out in the kitchen. And there were all sorts of people I'd go in and, you know, I could just jump into um, conversations that I found interesting. Right. So maybe how... like, go ahead. Well, I was saying that's somewhat how I felt like in synagogue, definitely in Brooklyn. But, uh, you know, I think politics ruined that in Judaism because uh, there's a larger connection between Judaism and politics and my politics didn't correspond with the mainstream Jewish politics or even like the authority type structure where you have the big players. And it's just kind of like, don't say bad things about these people. Like it's our practice to kiss these people's asses. And if you're not in line with kissing these people's asses, like uh, it's going to affect your relationship in the community. And certainly if you say bad things about the people that the majority of people are kissing their asses, like that's going to cause uh, uh, big problems. That wasn't as much of a problem with the Indians and maybe like related to your ADHD. That was something problematic where, where just the community has their politics. And if you don't agree, you got to keep your mouth shut or the community has the people who uh, you like, they, they, they're heroes. And if you don't think that they're heroes, you just got to keep your mouth shut on that. And if, if you weren't able to do that and it caused repercussions to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, understand that so how would you divide up your self-esteem like what are the primary sources of your self-esteem um i mean my family my friends my business and uh my research and um my positive feedback you know like my streaming um and and what i'm good at what i feel that like my accomplishments okay Okay, I'm going to run off. Uh, great to talk to you, David. Take care, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. God, God bless. Happy Thanksgiving. Okay, bye-bye.